So anytime that I'm going to talk about some type of pH, especially when we're going to talk about urine pH, I like to make sure that people know that I'm not talking about using like an alkalizing diet and all these idiot pH gurus that tell everybody that, oh, you have to alkalize or you're going to die. If your urine pH isn't high enough, you might as well tell your family that you love them and make some arrangements because you're not going to be around. So there's a lot of fiction in this world. And if you want to learn more about that, I'll put a link in the description below for our video on the truth about pH balance. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of that in this video. I just want to look at some different issues that can come about and make sense of the fact that why a high urine pH can create some trouble. Let's jump in. TC Hill is not a doctor and does not claim to be a doctor or licensed in any type of medical field. Don't be an idiot and use anything heard on the show as medical advice. This information should be used for educational purposes only and you should contact your doctor for any medical advice. Now get off me. So remember, I'm not a doctor and I'm not giving anybody medical advice here, but when we're looking at physiological markers like pHs in the body, it's important to understand that these are not diagnostic. You're not going to diagnose some issue with yourself by just looking at your pH. But I will put some links to some studies in the description below that we're going to talk about that go over some of the science of some of the issues that can show up when we see these varied pH levels. And an important thing to understand when we're thinking about why would we even want to look at physiological markers in the body is to understand that our blood is a compensatory fluid. And that means that the body has a goal of keeping that blood in check and keeping all the chemistry in that check in good order. And in order to do that, it will beg, borrow, and steal from other areas of the body to kind of balance that blood out and keep everything in check. So if all we're doing is just running blood tests, then we may not see a lot of things going wrong until things are going very wrong. By the time you see the blood way off, things have gone awry. But if we look at other areas of the body, we can get insights ahead of time of things that may not be operating correctly. So we teach in all of our books and courses to how to look at things like, you know, urine and saliva pH and your blood pressure and blood glucose and the rate at which we breathe. And when we look at a lot of these markers like this in the body, we can start to get a picture of how the body is operating and things that may be going wrong. Again, these are not diagnostic things, but if we can see some things that are out of balance and those things line up with the health issues that we're dealing with, then sometimes it's just a matter about balancing those things out and we can see improvement to those symptoms. And the reason you don't see a whole lot of studies on this topic is because who's going to pay for that? pH strips are like $18. A person can buy some pH strips at their local health food store and look at some of these things to get an idea of what's going on. So sometimes this is just about us getting our own insights into what may be helpful for us. So pH strips you can get on like Amazon or a health food store and I don't really care which ones you use. Sometimes it's like a tape and sometimes they're little strips with like a color at the end. Try not to get the ones that have three or four different colors all for pH. Those get real annoying and it's hard to understand what you're really looking at. I'll put a link in the description below to the strips that we use, but I'm not saying you have to use those. These are just the ones that seem to be easiest to read, but you can find them in a lot of different places. So what is high when we're looking at urine pH? And urine pH typically for a human is going to run in this area from 5.0 to 8.0. And we'll just put this 6.5 kind of as a a midpoint here. And when you look at the medical literature, they're going to say that it usually is going to run between this 6.0 and 7.5. But you know, way up here in this 7.5, you're going to see that it really has the ability to create trouble for a lot of different people. And what's important to understand is that the optimal urine pH may even vary from person to person. It can kind of be dictated by the rate at which you're breathing. The rate at which you're breathing can kind of be altered by how much your body is trying to compensate for a problem. And dependent on that breath rate can kind of dictate where your pH may lie, where you would feel and function optimally. And when we're looking at pH, we need to understand that this is kind of a logarithmic kind of a scale situation. So when you're looking at six and just one point higher of seven, that's actually a tenfold difference. So a, a urine pH of six would actually be 10 times more acidic than a urine pH of seven. So when we're looking at these different ranges, just a little movement here can indicate a significant difference in how the body may be operating. So a pH of 5.0 would be very acidic 
as to where a pH of 8.0 would be very on that alkaline side. So when we're looking at this, we also want to keep in mind that some medications have the ability to alter this pH. So if you're looking at a very high urine pH and you're taking some medications, you might want to ask your doctor if that medication has the ability to affect your urine pH at all. And that doesn't mean you need to stop taking that medication if your urine pH is high. You just want to understand if that's what's causing that to go high or not. And we'll talk about some other things that can make this urine pH go a little bit higher as well, but sometimes it just has to do with a person's physiology and they just happen to be leaning in a situation where that urine pH is a little bit higher. But the first trouble we wanna look at when urine pH is too high is recurrent UTIs. So if you're dealing with UTIs, we'll put a link in the description below for our video on improving chronic UTIs, but this is usually a case where the urine pH is too high and what that does is that sets up an environment in that bladder, in that urinary tract that allows bacteria to thrive there. Usually if the urine pH is down around this zone, it's going to be a little bit too acidic for that bacteria to thrive. So if someone's having chronic UTIs, a lot of times it's just because their urine pH is too high and if they can bring it down, now that environment is not as hospitable for this bacteria to thrive and they won't create a lot of trouble like this. So, you know, this is what the medical world views as a normal pH, but I just don't agree with that. We find that most people do their best somewhere between 5.8 and 6.3, 6.4, somewhere in that range. And I'm not gonna get too far into all the science of this pH stuff. It's a little more complicated than it's gonna fit in this video. But chapter 10 of my book, Kick Your Fat in the Nuts, kind of goes through how to run a lot of these simple self tests and understand what you're looking at when you're looking at different pH readings. And the book is available on Amazon, but I'll put a link in the description below so you can download the whole thing totally for free and you can just jump to chapter 10 if you wanna learn a little bit more about this stuff. But one insight is that there are supplements that a person could use to try to lower their urine pH, like vitamin C in the form of ascorbic acid has the ability to lower urine pH. Vitamin B6 can lower urine pH. Sometimes magnesium can lower it if it's right for that person. And you know, not every supplement is right for every person. That's why we teach people to look at their bioindividuality so they can adjust their supplements and diet according to what's right for their body so they can learn to work with their body instead of against it. So the next big issue we want to look at is when urine pH is high, for a lot of people this has the ability to create hypoglycemic type issues. And when we see a high urine pH, this is not always the case because there can be other things that can affect the pHs. And I don't want you to view this like high urine pH causes hypoglycemic issues. That's not what I'm saying. This is just a correlation that we see a lot. And I don't want to say that it's strong appear when the urine pH is high. Boy, that handwriting is really good there. But it's just a way to view it. Like when this urine pH is higher, it just appears that insulin appears to almost act like a bully, where it really, it just makes it more effective. So if a person's eating carbohydrates and sugars and their urine pH is high, then it has the ability to cause their body to uh, kind of process that sugar too aggressively and all of a sudden they sweep all that sugar out of the bloodstream and it creates a big sugar crash that creates these hypoglycemic type episodes. But there are different types of hypoglycemic issues. Some people are hypoglycemic because they're leaning on the insulin resistance side. So then the body has to make a whole lot of insulin to try and process this glucose that is not being processed correctly because the person has become resistant to this insulin. And then when the body makes a whole bunch of insulin, then it sweeps too much glucose out and they have a sugar crash. So I talk more about the differences in those different types of hypoglycemia in our video on who should not use chromium. And I'll put a link to that if you wanna dig into that video a little bit more. But when we're looking at this hypoglycemic issue, if a person takes steps to reduce their urine pH a little bit, a lot of times they can improve these hypoglycemic situations. And I see this a lot with kids too. If you have a kid that is having a lot of emotional or mental or just unstable kind of situations and they're kind of freaking out or they're really a jerk little toddler. You know, I don't know if you've seen these little toddlers, they can really be jerks. But when my kids are a jerk, I'll look at their urine pH and a lot of times it's way too high and I know, okay, they're a jerk because they're having sugar crashes because their body is processing these carbohydrates too aggressively. And what's interesting is that a lot of times this high urine pH is caused 
by someone consuming too many carbs and junk sugars. And it makes sense that this would cause this urine pH to go high and the body would want to adjust if there were too many carbs and sugars coming in, the body would say, well, I wanna change how I do this so that I can be more efficient at processing all these carbs and sugars that are coming in. So then the urine pH goes up and then we see that the body is more efficiently processing that glucose and sometimes when it gets to an extreme, it creates those sugar crashes. So again, I'm not giving you advice about what to do with your kids, but when I see this with my kids, if I can give them a little bit of vitamin C, you know, ascorbic acid kind of liquid, you can get those in most stores. If I give them a little bit of that to bring their urine pH down, then they're not processing their carbs and sugars so aggressively and they don't see those crashes and they can be an actual, you know, reasonable human. Now, usually with these hypoglycemic issues, there are other issues involved. I'll put a link in the description below if you want to dig deeper into our videos about hypoglycemia, but this high urine pH can be a big factor there. So what we want to look at is that when it's high and this insulin is over aggressive, then it makes sense that when urine pH is low, that that's where we would see someone leaning on that insulin resistance side. And we'll look at this study here on association of low urine pH with insulin resistance in non-diabetic Japanese subjects. And they found that when the urine pH was low, that the scores that they used to kind of judge insulin resistance went a lot higher. So they saw a very strong correlation in that. And this is what we see too. And it doesn't always line up because different things in the body can affect these pHs. But in most cases, when we see a client that's really leaning insulin resistant, especially if they're so insulin resistant that they become type two diabetic, we see their urine pH down in this zone, you know, 5.2, 5.5, somewhere around there. And just raising urine pH alone is not enough to fix insulin resistance. A person really needs to take other steps to do that. We have plenty of videos on that. But when you can raise that person's urine pH a little bit, then it does seem to help them process those sugars a little bit better and the other steps that they take become more effective. So don't view this as high urine pH is always bad and you want it to be as low as possible. There's plenty of trouble that can come when urine pH goes too low as well. Now there are some other factors that get a little bit more complicated as far as you know where the body is sending water as well as imbalances with the circadian rhythm. And it was Dr. Emmanuel Rivisi who helped us understand that the body has this natural circadian rhythm at the cellular level. Like during the day we should be in this catabolic state where the body is very good at creating energy and keeping us going all day. And then at night the body should move into this anabolic state where it's very good at resting and rebuilding and repairing. And the problem is some people can really get stuck in one of these states and it has the ability when they're really stuck and not moving back and forth to create a wide variety of health issues. In this overly catabolic state, we see a low urine pH, but urine pH alone is not enough to get an idea if one of these issues is going on. We really have to look at saliva pH and other measurements to get an idea what's going on here. And I teach you how to do that in chapter 10 of that book that you can get free below. I just kind of wanted to give you some insights into what we can look at because in this anabolic state, we usually see the urine pH higher and very close to the saliva pH. And when that's the case, the body sends too much water to the kidneys instead of the bowels and that can make the stool very hard and dry and create chronic constipation issues. There's other causes of constipation too, but this is a big one. We see a lot of anxiety in this overly anabolic state, as well as issues like tachycardia. So there's a lot of insights that you can gain just looking at your urine pH and some of these other measurements to get an idea of how the body's operating and what things you may need to balance out to create some improvement for yourself. Again, these issues have other underlying causes that I've talked about in a lot of other videos as well, but these are some big markers that we see show up when these urine pHs are going awry. Over here, when things are way too low, we see a lot of chronic diarrhea because too much water is going to the bowels. We see things like insomnia and insulin resistance like we were talking about. So when we're looking at these things with urine pH, you can see that you can really get some great insights about how your body's operating by just looking at some simple markers like urine pH. So if you want to understand that anabolic imbalance a little bit more, you can jump over right now and check out our video on understanding an anabolic imbalance. I hope this helps.